There's a story that you might have come across over the years, which is called Acres of Diamonds. And what it actually is, is a speech that was given by Russell Conwell. Now, most people will have heard the story about Acres of Diamonds, but they actually dismiss it. They believe they've heard it before, so they don't listen to it. They believe that it's just a story about a farmer that went in search of riches, only to discover that the farm that they once owned was, in fact, the largest diamond mining field ever found. And the moral of the story is that everyone has riches to be found in their backyard. So it sounds like a very simple parable. And because it's so simple, it's somewhat ignored. And then people don't stop to reflect on what it actually really means. And therefore just go about their life just as normal. They don't realize that there's a lot more contained in the speech that was shared by Russell Conwell. In fact, the story of Acres of Diamonds is just as much as relevant today with everything that's going on with the pandemic as it was back in the day when Russell was sharing his speech. So on this episode, I'm going to share with you some of the learnings that can be taken from the story Acres of Diamonds. Now, for those that don't know the story, I'm going to paraphrase what happened in the story. And for the people that think they know what the story is, I'm sure they'll only remember the part about the diamond farmer and not all the other stories. And although Russell Conwell talks about a lot of other areas of life in his speech, Acres of Diamonds, I'm going to pick out just a few of the elements. So here's a very brief synopsis. One day, an African farmer hears of many other people that are making money from working in diamond mines, that he decides to sell his own farm to go off in search of a diamond mine. He travels to many different countries in search of a diamond field, but after many years of not finding diamonds and ending up penniless, while standing on the side of a cliff where the water is raging, he gives up his search and throws himself in the water and drowns. Meanwhile, back at the farm, The person that bought the farm was one day walking along the river that crossed the farm and saw a stone in the river that glistened in the sunlight. So he picked it out and brought it back to his house, where he placed it on the mantelpiece. Some days later, a visitor came into the farmhouse, and while the visitor was talking to the owner, he noticed the stone on the mantelpiece and asked the owner if he knew what it was, which he didn't. The visitor then proceeded to tell the owner that it was in fact a very large diamond. The owner went on to say to the visitor that the river that crossed the farm was full of such stones. The farm that the original farmer owned outright turned out to be the most productive diamond farm ever. In fact, some of the diamonds that were found in the field are actually in the crown jewels of the Queen of England. If only the original farmer had the intelligence to investigate what diamonds looked like in the raw state, he would never have left his farm. Now, that's as much of the story that most people remember. But let me tell you some of the other elements of the story. A Californian ranch owner heard of gold being discovered in South California, so he decided to sell his farm and go and search for the gold. Then one day, the young daughter of the new owner of the ranch brought in some wet sand from the stream that she was playing with. And as the sand dried in front of the fire, gold fell out. At the time of the speech given by Russell, there was over $38 million of gold that had been recovered from that ranch. Then it was the man who sold his farm in search of oil, but later the new owner that bought the farm found the source of an oil field worth over $100 million, whereas the previous owner sold his farm for just $833. Then it was the geologist who earned $15 a week and felt he knew better and went in search for silver in Wisconsin, only to discover that the new owner of his homestead found silver worth over $100,000. Now, Is the moral of the story that you shouldn't sell your property without searching to see if it has diamonds, gold, oil or silver in the fields? No, it's not. But each of the examples that were given were absolutely true stories. Russell went on to tell other true stories, like for example the hat store owner that sat on a park bench observing the women that walked past to see what hats they wore. Then he made the same hat and filled his store front window with the hats that he saw other women wearing instead of wasting his time making hats that ladies wouldn't buy. That store owner, John Jacob Astor, who at the time of his death in the sinking of the Titanic, was worth in excess of $20 million. Then there was the poor man who had no money, who one day when he was bored sat on the shore of the bay near his home and carved a toy for his child. He only made one toy, but he had two children, so he ended up fighting over the toy. So he made a second toy. Now, while he was carving his second toy, a neighbour asked him why did he not make toys for the children in the town and sell them? He said he didn't know what toys to make, so the neighbour suggested that he ask his children. And so he did. 
and his children rattled off a whole list of toys that they would love to have. And because he had no money to buy wood to make the toys, he used the firewood that he had to make new toys and then sold them so that he could buy wood to make more toys. He finally built his business to be worth in excess of $100 million. Then there was the woman who found it difficult to button her collar, so she decided to find a new way to fasten a collar, and she ended up inventing the snap button, which is used widely today. You see, there were multiple examples that Russell gave in a speech, but everyone just remembers the story of the diamonds. So what are some of the elements that Russell was trying to share with his audience? Well, one of them was the one that many people think they know, which is that the source of your wealth is on your doorstep, but then they just dismiss it. But I'll come back to that one a bit later. One of the elements that Russell was teaching was the pursuit of get-rich-quick schemes is nonsensical. In the stories that were shared, it was the pursuit of getting rich quick from finding diamonds, gold, oil or silver. The problem with get-rich-quick schemes is that they're non-sustainable. And by the time you find out about them, it's too late. The real money has already been made by the few that started the scheme in the first place. Ask yourself, have you ever pursued any get-rich-quick schemes during your life? And if you don't remember any, I'm sure there are many people that remember the height of the Celtic Tiger, where people were buying properties that they'd never even seen in countries that they'd never even visited. But let's not go there. The other element that Russell was sharing was that the pursuit of money is the wrong pursuit. In fact, he references the Bible where it says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And what he explains is that it's the love of the money which is where people go wrong. It's not that money is evil, it's the love of money. Now, is money important? Absolutely. It's as important as oxygen. It's how we currently transact in the world. But I said in my first book, Evolve, that you never chase the money. You follow your purpose and the money follows. It's the love of what you do that drives you forward. When you're chasing the money, it doesn't come. Money follows, not the other way around. You never focus on the money. You keep an eye on it, but you never focus on it. So ask yourself, are you currently chasing the money or are you focused on your purpose? Russell also tells the story of when he was left in charge of his father's store and a farmer came in looking for a jackknife, but he didn't stock any. Then another farmer came in looking for a jackknife and then a third. And he ended up getting frustrated with all these farmers coming in looking for items that they didn't supply. The lesson he was teaching to the audience was that most business owners don't listen to what their customers want. They just sell their product or their service according to what they think their customer should want. There's a conversation that I teach my clients to have with their clients and customers, and I call it the value conversation. And if they follow the value conversation, then they end up unearthing riches from that conversation. The whole purpose of the conversation is to discover what it is that clients want and how valuable it is for them. When was the last time you stepped back from your business and researched what it is that people want? Now, let's explore another element that Russell was sharing. He says, of all the simpletons that stars shine on, I don't know of a worse one than a man who leaves one job before he has gotten another. Now, there have been so many people that I've shared with them what their true purpose is, and so many of them have said that they don't have the courage to do it, or mainly because they fear losing the income source that they currently have. So even though they dislike what they're doing, They would rather stay with what they're doing instead of pursuing what they're supposed to be doing and what would actually bring them their most fulfillment and joy. It's in these particular cases that I work through with my clients a way that they can maintain what it is that they're currently doing so as to maintain the income flow while also at the same time develop a new venture or to turn their current employer into being their first client. While I wouldn't go as far as to call people simpletons as Russell does, I do go as far as to say that it would be absolutely ludicrous to walk away from what it is that you're currently doing in terms of your income source before first establishing a new income source, unless you have the resource to do it. Which leads me to another element. It's better to be resourceful than to have the resources. Now, I've seen so many business owners throw away money in the hope that they will be successful. And I've seen it especially in businesses that receive large scale investments. And the reason being is that it's other people's money. It's not theirs. When you're pushed to the wire, you become more resourceful. It's the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. So if you find yourself desiring to establish a business that you would love to be doing, but you don't have the financial resources to do it, instead of focusing again on the money and focusing on the fact that you don't have the money to do it, how about asking yourself, how can you find a way to do it? 
It's a very different question to ask yourself and you'll find a much quicker way to find a solution. And if you've been following the other episodes on this podcast, you'll know that it's the job of the executive center in your brain to find a solution. The power lies in the questions you ask. Now, another element that Russell was making in his speech, not overtly in what he said, but in fact covertly, which was that the farmer felt he was poor because he heard about all the other people that were making money from finding diamonds. So he felt poor himself and so went in the pursuit of diamonds. What was happening was the farmer was comparing himself to other people. Up until the time that the farmer heard about the diamond field, he was happy in his life. He enjoyed his farm, his family and the money that he had. It wasn't until he heard about the diamonds that he became unhappy. You see, where in your life do you compare yourself to others? Now, this might be in terms of your car that you drive, the house that you live in, the money that you have, the relationship that you have, the knowledge that you have. The list can go on and on and on. But the fact that you're comparing yourself to someone else that you perceive is better than you in some way means that you're making yourself unhappy. Not only that, but you're pushing yourself out of equilibrium. And when you're out of equilibrium, then you're making things harder for yourself. So ask yourself, who are you looking up to? Who are you admiring? Who do you perceive is better than you in some way? And when you answer truthfully for yourself, then from your answers, you have true gold. You have true diamonds. Because then you know what has to be worked on so to bring yourself back into equilibrium. But let me go a little bit deeper with you on this one. And this one is going to be a stinger for you. Because you're comparing yourself to someone else, you're putting your self-worth down. Now, not only is that impacting on your confidence and how you feel about yourself, but it's also impacting on the level of income or the level of wealth you will manifest. Your self-worth dictates the level of wealth you will manifest. Your self-worth determines the income you will generate. Think of it this way. If your self-worth is low, you won't charge as much for your services. Whereas when your self-worth is high, you'll charge higher for your services. Will there be people that will buy your service at a low price? Yes, of course there will. Equally, there will be people that will buy your services at a high price. There are suppliers in the exact same industry right now supplying their product or service, but charging way more for their product or service than you are. It gets down to your self-worth. And your self-worth then brings about the rule of fair exchange, which you can think of as pure economics, a subject I absolutely love studying in college. Your customer base will match your pricing. So what do I mean by that? But it gets back to the pendulum that I keep referring to for your life and for your business. The pendulum will always be working to find its equilibrium stage. When you charge higher for your project or your service than your own self-worth, then you will feel you are overcharging for your project or your service. And therefore you will either over-service, over-deliver or reduce your prices in order for you to come back into equilibrium. Equally, if your customers don't feel there is fair exchange, then they will move away which means you have to find new customers that do value your product or service. On the other side, if you charge too low for your product or service, then you'll feel resentful and will end up under-servicing, under-delivering and will want to increase your charges or walk away from your customers or your clients. It's the interplay of your self-worth and fair exchange playing out so as to bring you into equilibrium. Now, if you want to increase your wealth, you have to increase your self-worth. And what's going to massively increase your self-worth? Well, it's when you're on your purpose. Just have a think about all the wealthy people that have made their wealth for themselves. There's Warren Buffett, Richard Branson, Oprah Winfrey, Steve Jobs. They were all on their purpose. They weren't pursuing the money. They were pursuing their purpose. And because they were pursuing their purpose, their self-worth was at their highest. The pursuit of your purpose is your key to wealth. So now then, From what you originally thought about the story of Acres of Diamonds, do you now realise that there's so much more in that story and I haven't even covered all the elements? But Russell goes on to say this, and I quote, The idea of Acres of Diamonds has continuously been precisely the same. The idea is that this country of ours, every man, has the opportunity to make more of himself than he does in his own environment. With his own skill, with his own energy, and with his own friends. End quote. So let me explain the essence of what Russell was conveying in the speech, Acres of Diamonds. We all know that Acres of Diamonds is referring to the fact that your success and wealth is right under your nose, 
or as Russell said in the speech, your wealth is too near to you, you are looking right over it. Your route to success and wealth and for you to reach your full potential is inside of you. It's your purpose. Your purpose, what it is that you're meant to do in your life? Your purpose is made up of your what, your how and your why. What you're supposed to do, in other words, your mission, how you're to do it or what I call your genius role. Why you're doing it in the first place or what I call your genius inspiration. And what gives you the most fulfillment and what unconsciously drives you to do what you're doing in terms of your purpose or what I call your genius drivers. It's all of these elements that make up the genius you. The genius you is you living your purpose in complete equilibrium. That's what the executive code is doing. It's guiding you to your genius you. The acres of diamonds is really your purpose. The diamonds are your purpose. And your true purpose is unique to you. It's the key to your success. The question is, do you want it? Now, let me finish with a short biography of Russell, because within his life journey, there too is a lesson to be learned. Russell Herman Conwell was born the son of a Massachusetts farmer. He enlisted in the army, where he sustained several injuries and attained lieutenant colonel status. After the army, he studied law, became an attorney, journalist and lecturer. He published 10 books and later was ordained a Baptist minister. He became a pastor and started preaching. He was instrumental in having the first Temple College built, which later became Temple University, along with the Samaritan Hospital. His Acres of Diamond speech first started with 46 audience members. By the time he passed away in December 1925, Russell had delivered his Acres of Diamond speech 6,152 times around the world. What's the lesson? Russell went from being a farmer's son to joining the army, to becoming a lawyer, a newspaper editor, a clergyman, a university founder, an author, to having a personal meeting with the President of the United States and becoming a public speaker, which resulted in his legacy of Acres of Diamonds, which is as relevant today as it was in 1925. How many times did Russell change his career or alter his path before finally being on his purpose? Was everything that he did influence and be part of the work of his purpose? Absolutely it was. And it's what I see and observe when I'm guiding clients to fulfill their own unique purpose. It's not about how many times you have to alter your career or your business to finally be on your purpose. It's about not holding on to what you're currently doing for the sake of fear or what others might think or what risks might present themselves. Sometimes like the trapeze artist, we need to let go of what we're holding on to before we can grab hold of the next trapeze. Is there more to be learned from Russell's speech, Acres of Diamonds? Yes, absolutely there is. But my aim was to share with you some of the items that you may not have even been aware of. Now, if you want to learn more about what I share in this podcast and learn how to discover your own true unique purpose, your own diamonds, then come join us in the Facebook group. And by the way, tomorrow's my birthday, believe it or not. We're just about to come up to one year of me running this podcast. And do you know what I'd absolutely love for my birthday? If you were to tell other people about this podcast, because in that way, we're all helping others to navigate their own life journey more easily. And come over to our Facebook group and let's join in the birthday celebrations. You'll find it by searching for The Executive Code or Paul William Davis on Facebook, or you can click on the link that's in the show notes, or go visit my website, paulwilliamdavis.com, and you'll find the link to the Facebook group there. Trust me, if you want to find out what your own acres of diamonds are for you, Join me in our Facebook group. And until next time, I wish you every success.